So as you know, we'll be working on lesson 10 here this morning, which is titled Modular Programming. So our objectives here are to understand what a function and a method is. You'll see they're very similar, just used in different environments. And we'll talk about and demonstrate how to create functions, but for the most part, since we're working in C-sharp here, we'll be creating custom methods as the demonstrations. You'll also need to understand what arguments and parameters are. Anytime you're using functions and methods, we need to be able to pass values into those functions or methods. And we talked a little bit about this on Tuesday. So you'll find that the arguments are the values that are passed in from the caller of the function or the method. And the parameters are the values that when we declare the function or method, we identify which parameters it will accept, how many parameters. And, in a typed language like C-sharp, we have to identify what type they'll be too. So, you know, integer and then what we're going to call the incoming integer or string and what we're going to call that incoming string. So those will be the parameters as we're declaring the method or the function. And then we'll learn how to call our custom functions and methods and pass the arguments to them. We'll also cover a concept called variable scope. So it'll be a good uh, illustration for you today uh, when you're creating your programs and creating variables you know we want to make sure that you understand that these variables if they're a value type which a lot of times they will be if they're an of integer type to begin with and remember integer types are value types meaning the value is actually being stored on the stack so anyway the one of the issues that we run into there is that when you pass a value into a function it actually just makes a copy of the original value stored in the variable. So then inside of the function, if you change the value, you're not changing the original variable. So we want to show you that. And that's actually, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, that's actually more uh, dealing with the passing by value than by reference. Variable scope is just where you define, where you declare the variable. If it's outside of all your functions and your methods, it's what we call global. But if you put it internal to a method or a function, then it's, it's local to where it was created, meaning you can only access the values, the variable names within the structures where they were created. So like I said, I got a little ahead of myself in the last bullet that I had in there. We'll also talk about passing the value, uh, passing by value as opposed to passing by reference. So when you're passing, you're, when you're calling a method or a function and you're passing a value into it, when they're stored, the values are stored on the stack, they're just having a copy of the value that is put in the memory and passed on to the function. And so when we're changing the value inside the function, we're not really changing that original variable. And so we got a good demonstration to show you how that works. Okay, so to introduce the subject to you, procedural programming, introduce the concept of the go to and go sub commands in our programming languages. So the idea of a go-to was to redirect the program flow from the current line position to another line position, which would be identified in that go-to statement. So you can see the example there would be like go to 400. So whatever line we were at, that would just redirect the flow to that line number and it would just pick up at that point and it would keep going. And then go sub uh, would also redirect the program flow. But the idea of the go sub was it would go to a particular line number and then return back to the line number where that go sub statement was called from. So this is a, kind of the introduction of the beginnings of a structure that was known as a subroutine. And so that's what has evolved now, these subroutines has evolved into what we call methods and functions. The whole idea being that you're gonna have blocks of code that you're gonna have and you know, need to run multiple times usually within your program. And we want to just basically wrap those blocks of code in a name. And every time we call that name, that'll run those blocks of code. So unlike the go-to where it would just continue at the end of that, you know, the next line of code would be read. It's more like the subroutine where we would run the block of code and then return back to the line where it was called from. So let me show you. I've got a little example here for you. This is of oh, the very first program that I ever wrote. So I called this HAL 9000, I was real original. Stole that from HAL from the 2001 movie. And so the HAL 9000 was a, a little dating program, not very sophisticated. It basically asked for your name, your sex and your age, and then made a determination of whether or not the computer would be willing to date you or not. 
Uh, if you see the graphics, actually this big graphic here is a video that I shot. Uh, this was built on an old Intellivision game system. And uh, so I, just, I took a video of the screen so you could see it running. It takes a while, you can see like five minutes, so I don't wanna go through it here, take up class time. But I can show you uh, the code down below here. Before we get there though, just take a look at, this is how we used to store our codes on cassettes. And I used to have a little note card that I would record when I would write a new program. I'd have to record then what the tape number was on the cassette and where it ended at. So that would tell me how I could go back and find that program on the, the cassette. Because those are, you know, all linear. They're, they're not uh, randomly accessed like a disc is. So you have to start at the beginning of the tape and go all the way through, you know, foot by foot until you get where you need to be. And then you could load your program into your little computer, which our little computer at the time was this, uh, let me show it to you right here, this Intellivision computer. So this is the game machine on the left, and this is the computer device that had 16K of RAM on the right there. And so what we would do is we had hooked up a cassette deck to that, and that's how you'd load your programs, or as I'm writing from the keyboard here, I'm saving into the 16K memory, and then when you save it, it would save it back out to the cassette deck. You can see in this little graphic here, there's the connections to the cassette deck. So that was- And, uh, whole, and I got a question. Yeah, go ahead. Is the whole thing connected to the TV or the computer? Yeah, at this time, you would connect it to a CRT, right? So that's when we had cathode ray tubes TVs, so you would just hook it up to the antenna. This particular one, um, I'm trying to remember, I think it even had a super VHS connection on it, but it's, it's been a while since I looked at it, so I can't say for sure. But yeah, you were, you were connecting it using an analog signal. It wasn't a digital signal because CRTs were analog devices, right? We had to feed frequencies of information into those devices to get the display on the screen, whereas now we're feeding digital information into our devices to get the display on the screen. Okay, so uh, this was written in uh, 1982, you can see, so not quite 40 years old. Man, I can't even believe it. <laughs> it's been that long. But the main thing I want you to see is a couple of concepts. First of all, these original languages, this was written in what they called IntelliBasic, which was a modified version of the original basic written by Bill Gates for the PC. And uh, so that had the concept of having to identify each line of code by a number you can see out here to the left. And so that's why the go subs and the go twos would work because every single statement in the program has a line number identified for it. So that's how we could you know, use these go subs and go to values to point to a different location. So remember go sub would go to that location and come back whereas go to would go to that location and then just continue from that point forward. So I'm not gonna go through all the details of the code but you'll see that the way that basic works is you had a line number and then you had a particular command. And uh, in the case of a print command, we were just displaying this string value out to the screen. And then you can see we had several go subs here. And the go subs were at the beginning of the program, I just was playing around with various characters from the keyboard to try and make a fancy looking splash screen that would go by. And anyway, so that's just a little routine that goes through displaying a bunch of weird characters on the screen several times. Uh, then it just goes through and it has certain prompts. So you'll see that when there's a get command, that's where we're taking in values or a put command when we're taking the value from the variable and displaying it. And you can see just uh, a lot of lines of code. Obviously we're not going one, one at a time here. In fact, it's important to notice that we don't go one, two, three, four, five. And the reason for that is, as you're writing your code, you'll realize that you needed to have something inserted back in the previous section of your code. And the, if you ha had all your numbers in sequence, one, two, three, four, five, then that would just really screw things up. If you tried to uh, change, say number three to something else and elsewhere in your program, you already had a go sub to three and it was expecting to go to the other line of code. So this, this became what they called spaghetti code because it's very difficult to keep track of. If I saw, you know, like this first line here, I just happen to know that that goes to those weird characters and loops them around, but go sub 2000 really doesn't tell us anything. 
you know, 20 years from now, <laughs> just, I, it, just because I've gone through this a few times with other classes, I remember what that does. But, you know, as you, as you go back and look at your code, looking at go sub and just some line number, it really doesn't tell you anything. So it's just very difficult to track programs using that methodology. And so that's why modern day programming languages, they did adopt the go sub, but we don't use line numbers anymore. And we put meaningful names in for our functions so that it helps us to remember what those functions or methods do. Okay, so just again, defining functions, methods, they're just blocks of code, series of statements. And the whole idea is that those are blocks that we need to run over and over again in our program. As far as the difference between the two, a function and a method, not really a lot of difference. It's really kind of the environment or the context that we find them in. So when we're writing in procedural programming, the blocks of code that are organized by a name are referred to then as a function. Whereas when you're working with object-oriented programming, those same blocks of code that get assigned a name, they're referred to as methods. And it gets kind of tricky, especially when I'm dealing with JavaScript, because JavaScript is generally a procedural based language. And so I build my own custom functions, but JavaScript also has objects that are part of its library, like the date object and the array object. And so those are built in a class, you know, an object oriented, object oriented environment. So what that means is whenever I'm dealing with say the date object, I want to use the JavaScript date object in my program, then all of the uh, functionality of that particular object is all organized into what they call methods. So I'm in that environment, I'm actually using both functions and methods, again, depending on the context. If I'm using an object oriented block of code in my JavaScript, then I would be referring to its methods. If I'm just creating my own custom blocks of code, then those are going to be referred to as functions because I'm writing them directly into the JavaScript program and I'm not building them inside some sort of a, a class format. See all of our C sharp, just to kind of remind you how it works here. Let me see. I've got that up somewhere. Here we go. So just to remind you what our basic C sharp program looks like, you know, we're inside of a class whenever we're writing our code in C sharp here. So this line of code right here, that is the main, that's why we refer to that as a method because we're building it inside of a class. In JavaScript, you don't have a class. I mean, you, you can actually build classes in JavaScript, but the, the outer wrapper of the entire program is not a class. In object-oriented programming like C-sharp, everything begins inside of a class because this is just the way that C-sharp compiler is set up. It expects all your code that you're going to run to be inside of a class. And default is to make it program. You can call it whatever you want, but that's what it's looking for is, is your first class there in the file and then in that class, the main method, and it knows then that's the code that needs to be fired off first. So this is just reiterating there that the main is a method. We're inside of the class. Also, yeah, looking at that main, and again, we did talk a little bit about this on Tuesday, that when we're creating our methods and our functions, as we declare the, the signature for them, which is the first line before the curly braces, the curly braces just for blocks of code. Um, we have the keyword here static, and I mentioned that allows us then to use this main without creating a separate instance of the object. But even more important for both functions and for methods is that we will identify, well, it is different in a function. Functions, you don't have to tell it whether it's gonna return a value or not. But in a method, you do have to identify whether your method returns a value back to the caller. And so that's what this void keyword is here. Void means no, this method will not return any value back. The method will run, it'll complete, it'll go back to the caller, but there's nothing being returned from it. 
So later on, um, as we're creating our method, you'll see that we actually need to identify if it returns a value, we'll actually have to put the data type in there in place of void. So in other words, if we had a, a calculation in here, for instance, and we wanted to return the, the result of the calculation and it was gonna be of int value, we would just type in int there and that would identify the fact that we would have a return statement in here and I don't have any variables created. So well, we got args there. So let's go with the string args. That was actually being passed into it here. But the idea is <clears throat> two steps. One, and again, strictly for methods in the class environments, you have to, within the declaration, within the, the header of the method, identify the data type that's being returned and then have a return statement that actually returns that data type. So I can't return a string from here, which that's why I'm, it's still throwing an error, see? If we change this to string, let's see, I think that'll fix it. Yeah, no, still doesn't like it. Oh, that's right, that's an array of strings. So we could say it's returning a string array. Now it likes it. So this right here, the reason we kept getting errors is this needs to match the type that's being returned here. And remember, this is actually identifying that that this is coming in. This is the parameters, right, for the method. And we're having to identify the type. So we're saying we're going to receive from the caller a, st a string array, and we're going to call it ARGS, short for arguments. So that's in your your classes and your, your methods, we have to have the data type and the return value has to match that data type. That's not true in like JavaScript where we're just doing procedural programming. In JavaScript, we'll just use the keyword function. Let's see if I have a quick JavaScript example. Well, we do have the video that'll be demonstrating it here. So I think it'd be best if we go to the video to demonstrate that, but let me just make sure I've covered everything here. Uh, well, the only other thing, we talked about the void. We should talk about the uh, other aspect of the class environment where they have what are called access modifiers. So static, again, we've seen, that just means the method can be used within the program that it's written in. But if other programs want to use our methods, we can define public or private. And the default, by the way, is public. We don't put anything in there. It would just assume public, the compiler would assume public. Uh, but public would mean that any outside program could come in and call our method, whereas private would mean that only the um, program where the method was defined could actually use that method. And if you'd like, I've got a video studio solution for you that you can download and unzip it. That's got uh, most of the code I think that we're going to use in the examples here today. So let's go ahead and start with the first video here. This will show you the difference then between creating the methods and then creating the functions because this one is focused on JavaScript and, and functions. Let's make sure we're sharing our computer sound. We are, so let's go. I've got a few simple. So I have a simple function. All right, we're gonna come back to that video <clears throat> here in just a little bit, but you could see there how easy it was to create the function is just a keyword function, give it some name and then a set of parentheses and then a pair of curly braces and then everything, all the statements inside of those curly braces will run when that function is called. And so the narrator there made a very interesting point showing you that the function was actually declared first as far as the sequence of the code, but it wasn't until the caller of the function was added below the declaration of the function, that was actually the first line that was run. So the way that the interpreter looks at that is it loads that function into memory, but it doesn't have the code inside of it actually processed until there's somewhere else in the code that that function is being called. And that's true with methods as well. So all of that from a compiler standpoint in a class environment, that all again gets loaded into memory initially and that <clears throat> would be a reference value by the way, meaning that whole structure would be stored on the stack 
I'm sorry, on the heat. Um, and then <clears throat> all of that code would run only when there's a line of code that actually calls it from within the program. And as they said uh, at the end of that video, then the next thing is we want to start passing values in there. So what we're going to do here this morning is to kind of build a program from scratch and then modify it as we go, as we learn more about these functions here. <clears throat> so go ahead and open up your Visual Studio if you want to follow along. Trying to find where I've got my instance here. Yeah, this is the one I just started this morning. So <clears throat> all I did here is just create a C Sharp console app, just basic format. Uh, it's modular programming examples is the namespace. Just that's what I typed in when I created the program and the solution. So then inside of the program, we've got our main method. Inside of the main method, then we've got a console write line, hello world, as we know. And then I was just messing around with this earlier here. So we need to actually get rid of that. So we know that that's the way that, you know, the template starts, right? Like that. So from there then, what we're gonna do is go to our instructions here and copy this block of code and put it in the main. So just, basically replacing the console write line statement there, right? So inside of the main now, we've declared two integer, number one, number two, assigned values to them, so they're initialized. And then using an if statement, you can see we're making a comparison between those two variables. So we're looking to see if number two is greater than number one. If that returns true, then we just do a write line statement that says that two is greater than one. If that's false, then unless they're equal, uh, that would mean that grade, number one is greater than number two. And then of course, these are hard-coded values in here, and this is all happening in the main, so really nothing fancy going on at this point in time. That, that's how we've written our programs kind of up to this point. So uh, it says examine the code. Notice it's similar to the if-else that we use in our decision structures two integer variables, initialized with values, using the if-else structure, evaluating the conditional expression, comparing number two to number one, determining the output. And again, just if two is greater than one, that's the output. If it's not, then one greater than two would be the output. So now that we know <clears throat> that that code is running correctly as expected, we wanna ask ourselves, you know, how can we compartmentalize this code? so that we can easily reuse the uh, structure there that, <clears throat> that's doing the evaluation without having to actually retype it over and over again. So what we'll do is we're gonna create the, a custom method. It's going to be called compare numbers. And then inside of there, as we get down here a little bit further, you'll see that we'll write all of the code inside of that custom method. I'll point out something too, and I don't know, yeah, I didn't actually change it in this tutorial yet. Uh, da, 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 da. Just let me double check, because I was playing around with this yesterday and I made a change because, let me show you up here, something I had noticed in the uh, newer version of Visual Studio. So if you look closely at this screen capture, you'll see there's three dots underneath of the compare numbers. That's the custom name that I created for my, my method here inside of our C Sharp program was compare numbers and I made it camel cased. So I, I did a little research on it yesterday and I learned that uh, Microsoft is being a lot stricter now as far as naming is concerned. This is not actually gonna throw an error, but what that's really telling me is that's not our preferred format for writing C Sharp code. So in the C Sharp environment, they use what's called Pascal case. So I introduced you to camel case where the first letter is always lower and then each subsequent word is capitalized. Pascal case means that each word is capitalized. So technically speaking, <clears throat> we should actually make that a capital C to just 
match the you know Microsoft way of doing things. Again, it wouldn't throw an error. Compiler would run it just fine. But they're also now you know giving us uh, you know popping up. They have to, this special program that runs in the background. Every time you're writing code, you got IntelliSense running. <clears throat> so I noticed that with each iteration with Visual Studio, IntelliSense seems to get a little smarter and, and identify more and more things to me. Um, you know, little subtleties about their their methodology as far as how they prefer us to write code. So it, it really is up to us, but they're recommending when you're in a C-sharp environment, all of your methods should be in Pascal case when you name them. So that's just kind of a minor point, <clears throat> but I thought it was interesting. It was just something I kind of have been seeing, and then I went and did a little research to figure out why that kept popping up every time I was doing the camel casing. Okay, so at this point then, um, let's go ahead and create the custom method in here. Here's the code for it. See that we're using the keyword static. That means that we can use it right away within the program. It's not gonna return anything initially, so we're using the void keyword there. And then we just have the name of the method, which is gonna be compare numbers, set of parentheses, set of curly braces, and then just a statement comment that you know, identifies where we're gonna put everything into. So we'll copy that back into here. We'll go, go outside of main now. So you don't wanna define or declare a function inside of another function. I'm sorry, I'm not in JavaScript anymore. In C Sharp, you don't wanna declare a method inside of another method. So I'm outside of the closing curly brace here after the end of that main method, but still inside of my program class. So everything in C-sharp anyway has to be contained within the program class. So here's the first method in my program class that was already written for us as far as the body, the, uh, not the body, but the outer wrapper, right? The, the main method. And so now what we're gonna do is go right below that method and add in our new custom method. So really nothing happening, just declaring it at this point. So we'll save that, go back to the instructions now. Um, below that, I got a little graphic that just breaks down all those components, which I went through for you. And again, I wanna re-emphasize, and this is true for functions as well, that's referred to as the signature, that first line. So a lot of times when you get into higher level programming, uh, there will be some techniques where you, you need to match your method signatures when you're doing certain things. And so that's why it's important to know that's the, the signature is the first line and then the curly braces and all the code written in between, that's called the method's body. So uh, the next step then is we're just gonna cut all that code that's inside of the main method and paste it into the compare numbers method. So that means we want to take everything then was in main. We'll do a control X, cut that out. And then right here now where I have the add statements, I'll just overwrite that with that code there. Now nothing happens at this point. We run the program, it's going to run main and main's not doing anything. So the program would just end immediately because we have to actually call the function for anything to happen here. Okay, so, uh, okay, it's not shown at that point, but it does reference right here then that we need to add a call to the compare uh, numbers method and then run the program. So let's go ahead and do that. I guess I didn't put an example in for that, but we can do that. So again, to make this actually happen, you know, anything happen in here, we have to call that block of code. So we wanna just type in compare numbers, which is the name of our method. And so see, that's just a single statement. That now, when main fires off, will run this statement. And then this statement means that it's going to actually run all this block of code down here. So if we want to, we can go ahead and run it. And we can just see it. You know, we have hard-coded values in there. Number two is 20, number one is 10. So obviously number two is greater than number one. But at this point, the main point, the main focus, the main 
point that I'm trying to make is that's how we got the results down here to run is we had to call it from the main because the main again in a C sharp program always the first thing to fire off so we have to put something in there that then makes a call to the custom method that we've created. So the next thing we'll look at then is parameters, which means it'll include arguments as well. And so we got a little video for that. So everything that he talked about there with regards to functions is also applicable to methods. So we call the values that are being sent to our methods. Those are arguments, the values received by the method. Those are the parameters. And then the parameters are used internally by the method. We usually do some sort of processing. And then <clears throat> as he said, you know, usually you're gonna have a return command in there as well, a return statement that'll take the results of the processing in the function, return it back to the caller. And then usually it's the caller that's gonna display then the results of running the particular function. So we'll go down here now and we'll set it up so that we can, in the program that we've been working on, call that compare numbers function and actually pass values into it. The uh, example that we're using here at the moment, the function is, I mean, the method is still generating the output. It's doing the comparison and then it generates the output. But now we're making it more flexible because now we can actually pass values into it. So we'll have the arguments, you know, we can type in any two values here when we're calling our compare numbers function, as long as we make sure that we go in and modify the custom method that we've built and uh, identify the data type and then what we want to call them internally here when we're processing inside of the method. So let's go back to our code and do just that. So up here is where we're going to plug in a couple of hard-coded values. And then here we need to identify that we want to accept an int and we're going to call it number one and then another int and call it number two. So we don't need to have these hard-coded values anymore. So now the uh, caller is calling the method passing two values into it of int type, the custom method receives those values as int type, int type, assigns them to a variable name, and then uses those values internally, in this case, again, doing the comparison, and based on that comparison, generating the output. So at this point, uh, it still should be the same result, right? Number two is gonna be greater than number one. Let's go ahead and run it, control F5. And we see that is the case. Number two is greater than number one. Of course, we could very easily now just come back in here and flop that within the caller. We can make it 200 for number one and 100 for number two or whatever I typed in, 110. All right, so we'll save that and run it. And of course, that now makes it so number one is greater than number two. So the change that we made there is that when we called the function from the main method, now we actually passed values to it or arguments, right? From the caller standpoint, those two values are the arguments. And then in order for our custom method to be able to handle those arguments, we had to define that it would accept two parameters. The way we did that was identify the type and the name for each of the parameters, and then use those names internally to do the processing. Any questions about this? Does it seem pretty straightforward to everyone? I just had a question, um, and uh, we're, we're probably going to be going over it in 
class. Um, I was just wondering uh, how it would be possible to pass a number through that was input by a user into the uh, into the oh, argument. Sure. Yeah, just in your main, what you could do is take in input from your user. And then the values that you get from the user, those would be the arguments that you would pass into your custom method. Okay, and, and you just think, define those as a as a separate integer value. Yeah, I think I do actually have an example here. Um, No, I guess I never did write it uh, as, oh, here it is down here. Yeah, so if you wanted to, see, we could add this structure here into the main method. And then uh, pass it right here. So let's, oh, okay, perfect. I'm, we're all the way down at the bottom there, but let me just grab that and show you. because this takes it even a step further. So this is what I was just showing you as far as taking the input, but down below now, you'll see that I added a uh, else statement so that it can allow for if the two numbers are equal. So it's still going to be the same process, right? We're still using in the console.write line, we're calling and oh, this is, that's right. This is where I updated it yesterday. Notice these are in Pascal case. Uh, so calling the compare numbers method, passing into it the two values that the user types in. But now what I'm doing is I'm doing a complete comparison. That's the way I would see it anyway. I'm comparing to see if one number is greater than the other, but if neither is greater than the other, then the result must be that they're the same or equal. And I just changed the naming here a little bit. Um, yeah, you can see that we're returning the output here. So I had to create a variable inside here to hold the contents of the output. So based on our if statement, we're gonna have assigned to this output variable the correct text that we wanna have printed to the screen. And notice that's using the string interpolation format too. And trying to update all my stuff for string interpolation because it's just so much cleaner. So there's a lot of you know, ways that we can play this, but the main thing is just to understand that when you're creating your own custom methods, you're gonna to have to identify the parameters and their data types if you're in a strict data type environment. And you saw it's a lot easier in, in JavaScript. And you know, probably in your career, it kind of depends on what path you end up going, but I just, from my own experience, I guess I should say, I do so much web development. We do mainly client side is almost all JavaScript. So you have to know JavaScript quite well, but then on the server side, we're using C sharp because I'm in a Microsoft server. So you have to know C sharp quite well as you know, in, in going back and forth a lot like that, back and forth all day long can really cause your brain some strain. But uh, it, the, the basic principles are, are the same, you know, just creating custom blocks of code, wrapping them in a name essentially. And then if we need to pass values into it, just identify that in the parentheses, what you wanna call them as they're coming in. And in a data strict environment, you also have to identify the type that that value is coming in as. So those are the parameters and then the caller, just all the caller has to do is just put in the arguments. Okay, so the next thing I wanna talk about is, is variable scope. So uh, let's go back and look at what we have in our code just real quick. Where is that one? Nope, that one, there it is. So variable scope deals with, uh, for instance, this is a good example of it here. We created this variable inside of our custom method. So that output variable only exists inside of that method. If I didn't return, if I didn't have this keyword to return that value back to the caller, if I were to comment that out, we would get an error up here because it would attempt to 
Well, in this particular case, it really wouldn't attempt to do anything. It would pass the values into here, and this whole thing would process, and output would be assigned the correct value. But once we got to the end, nothing's being returned back to the caller here. And I should point out, I forgot to point this out earlier. Notice that I did change my header here on compare numbers to read string, and that's because that's what we were returning as the output, right, was a string value. No longer were we returning an integer value back to the caller, but now we're returning this string, which is the actual output that we want displayed on the screen. So output only exists, that the value only exists inside of that method. If I would go outside of the method or even come up here, you know, if I just, uh, let's just say I change that, yeah, that wouldn't make a lot of sense. So let's just say underneath we'll do console.writeLine and we want to display the results or the value that's stored in output. And so you can see we get an error there. If we rest the mouse over, it says the name output does not exist in the current context. So the context meaning as far as this method is concerned, there is no variable called output. The only place that that variable exists is inside of this method here. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about variable scope. So let's take a look at the video and then we'll come back and do a demonstration on it. Okay, so you see there the uh, concept of the local variable and the global variable. And then I have it down here for you in code fashion for our C sharp. So in this first example here, you can see that I've created this program called variable scope. And I've declared and initialized a variable X value of 10. And then we call our custom method down below here, which is designed to just display the value of X. But you can see right away that even when I did the screen capture here, I was getting errors on the screen. So let me uh, go ahead and copy. Do I have the sample code here for us? No, I don't. I've got it here in this other program. So let me just bring this one here over to you. There we go. So this is in that collection of files. That's the solution that I was showing you at the top of the page that you can download and load up into your own Visual Studio. So it's titled Variable Scope. You can see I've got it set as the startup project here. Yeah, I'm not sure where the heck that came from. So uh, this is just like the example. We've got the main method here. We're initializing X as 10, calling the custom method test scope. And then the idea of test scope down here would be to display the value of, of X. You can see we're getting errors here. And I know that as soon as I run this, control F5, I'm going to get that error message because it won't even build. And look at the error message. It says the variable X is assigned, but its value is never used. So that's the first error, right? Up here, we created it, and it thinks it was never used because it could only be used inside a main. And then the other error, uh, the name X does not exist in the current context. So that's referring to the X, the attempt to use the X then down here in the console.write. So what we would need to do is a couple of things. Uh, we would need to pass this local value to our method. And then the method, of course, we have to identify what it's coming in, what the type is. So we'll put in there int x. So now you can see all the squigglies go away. Now when I do control s and then control f5, then we get the actual output. And the only reason that we're able to get that is because we passed the value, which it actually copied the value of x from memory, passed it into the function, and then the function just went ahead and displayed that value. So two steps, 
one, we had to pass the value. In the case of, well, functions or methods, uh, we have to also make, set up the parameter so that when the caller is going to pass us a value that we, in the function of the method, can accept that value. And in the methods, we would have to data type them. Functions, you don't. You just stick an X in there. Making sense? Uh, just to kind of take that another step, let me do another process here. Uh, so let's make this a global variable. So what I'll do is I'll go ahead and take out the parameter now and take out the argument. But when I initialize my X value, I'm going to do it outside of the main method. So that's now called a global variable because it's global to the entire program because it's declared outside of any method that is in the program. Let's see what we're getting here. Uh, make the field out, oh, that doesn't matter. What's this one though? Object reference required for the non -stat. Oh, uh, that's right. We also, because <laughs> we're in a class environment, we got to make this static just like we do our methods. <laughs> Okay, so that variable, because I think I mentioned to you on Tuesday that when you're working in a class environment, you have to create an instance of the class to be able to use any of the members of the class. To override that requirement, we can use that keyword static. So anytime you're going to use a variable or a method uh, within your program, if you don't want to have to do what we would normally do, let me kind of give you a quick demonstration if I could. Eh, it probably won't work here because I'm just in the namespace, but you would, you would say, okay, I want to create a new var. We're going to call it my var, and that's equal to a new program because program is the class. So essentially that's now creating an instance, meaning it goes in, it, it takes this entire block of code that is the program code, puts it into memory, treats it now as it's referenced as my var. So now if I did like my var dot X, and again, it's not really gonna be working here because I'm not in the right place, but my var dot X, that would be how I would actually access the, the contents, the value that's stored in X in the um, my var variable, which is all of the code that makes up program. So I know that's probably a little bit more that we need to go into at this point, a little bit more complex, but that's what it's like to be in an object oriented programming environment. So as long as you're working within the existing blocks here, you know, within your program, if you wanna call the members of your program, just always add that static keyword. So now when we run this, because it's a global variable, see we don't have to pass it. So there, it does print out the result. So that means it is running the function, running that console write line statement. And uh, the only reason it was able to display that value is because I now declared it, initialized it outside of any of the methods inside of my program. So now it's a global. That's a global variable. Whereas when I put it in here, that's a local. Didn't do my two forward slashes, so it tried to assume what I was trying to write there. All right, let's go boom, boom, local variable. There we go. So at this point, We've got X equal to 10, it's a global variable that can be used down here, so that'll be the output, but the fact that we have uh, X equal to 20 in here is not gonna have any input down here. That's, we're only changing it inside of here. Uh, so we just talked about variable scope, the fact that we have local variables, wherever they're declared, whatever structure they're declared, they're, the value and the, the variable itself only exists within that particular structure. So that's a local variable. And if we create variables outside of all of our structures, all of our methods or our functions, then we have what's called a global variable, which means that that value can be used anywhere within the program. And it's actually very much frowned upon to create global variables. If you can help it, you should generally always create local variables and then pass those values into your, your functions and your methods by you know, using the arguments uh, of the caller. 
global variables get you into the problems really quickly because what happens is if you're creating a lot of variables in your program, you've got a huge program that you're writing, you'll start getting conflicts probably. And also part of modern day programming is you're going to actually be creating components that are going to be used by other programmers in their code. And so you don't want your variables to be conflicting with the variables they might create. So another reason for creating local variables as opposed to global variables. So the last thing we take a look at here is the concept of passing your values. So when we're talking about the caller um, and passing values in our functions, uh, we're passing either by value or by reference. So by value means that whatever the value of the variable is, that's what's being passed into the function. Or if it's a complex object like a class, or uh, strings, all of those types of things are all stored on the heap because they're what we call reference variable types or value types. You know, they're so huge, they can't be stored on the stack. The stack is, the, the width of the stack is always determined by the CPU that you're using. So if you exceed the number of bits, 64 bits in a 64 bit processor, which you would when you're creating these more complex structures like classes, um, they have to be stored into the heap. And then what happens is on the stack, they actually just put the address in memory where that structure begins. So the primitive values like the integers and the, the doubles, you know, all those simple data types, they're always stored on the stack as a value. The problem with that then is that when we pass those values into our functions or methods, the compiler or interpreter is actually just going to make a copy of the value, pass that into the function. And so when the function or the method modifies the value, it's only modifying that value internally. It's not modifying the original variables value. In order to be able to change the original variable's value, instead of just passing the integer into the method as you normally would, you have to add a keyword in there in C-sharp, which is the reference keyword, R-E-F. And so the reference keyword tells the compiler, go ahead and use the address of this variable. And then when we use it internally in the function, any changes that are made to the variable are actually affecting the original variable. So you need to know that obviously as a programmer, whether you're modifying the actual value that's stored in the original variable, or if you've just got a copy of it and you're just manipulating that copy and never actually changing the value within your variable. So that's essentially what passing by value, passing by reference is all about. So I actually have a couple of instances, demos here for you in Visual Studio. Let me go find it. Let's see though, that was the one we were working on for the sample. Who the heck is that sucker? This one here is compare numbers program. So we want to be here. There we go. There we go. Okay. So in this is again in the uh, solution file that I had at the top of this lesson that you can download and load up in your own Visual Studio. So the first thing we'll look at then is uh, passing by value, which is the default. So let's go ahead and make that the startup project. Let's go ahead and close this and take a look at the code that we've got here. So in this example, you can see that in our main method, we've declared our variable x, we've assigned a value of 10 to it. Then I have a console.write line statement that will display for us what the value of x is. Then underneath of that, we're calling a custom method that we built down here called multiplication and we're passing to it the variable x. Because we're not adding the keyword ref in here, reference, we're, all, we're passing it then as a value, meaning whatever the value of x is here in main, it's the value now that's being copied, 
And that's what's actually being passed to the custom method is that value of 10. And so what we'll do here is we'll take A then, multiply it times A, which will give us 100, right? We're just squaring it. And then we output the value of A. So A will show us that we have manipulated the value that was passed in. That'll display 100 right here in this, no, in uh, this output. Then we do the outline here where we take a look at after we've passed that value into our custom method here and after we have manipulated it and displayed the value of that manipulated value, then we come back and we check to see what the current value of X is. And it'll show us it's still the value of 10. That's because again, we haven't manipulated what is in the, the actual variable. We've just created a copy of the value and that's what's being passed into the method and that's what's being used in the processing of the method. So let's run it and see it. Control F5. And bring the results over here. So you can see, here's that initial output statement, variable value before calling the method 10. So that's this line right here. And then uh, after the method is run, so now internally, we had this output statement showing the value of A is 100. But then coming back, after we ran the method, you can see we've still got the value of 10 assigned to X. So that's because it was passed by value, not by reference. So now let's show you an example of passing by reference. Set that as our startup program. Open that code up. Similar program. The only difference is we've added this reference keyword in here. So even though it's coming in as A and being manipulated here, it's actually A now represents the address of X in memory on the stack. And so since A is the address of X in the stack, any changes that we make to A are affecting then that original variable X. That's because we're passing it by reference now, we're passing the address of the variable into the function or the method, not uh, the value. So let's go ahead and run that. Control F5. So here you can see slightly different output. So now again, the first console.write line shows that the value originally was 10. Then we uh, pass it into the method by reference. So the output there is still the same. We multiply A times A, we get 100. But then notice when we come back inside after the call to our custom method here, we're coming back inside now, and we've got another console write line to see what the current value of X is. And now X has been modified. It has been multiplied by 10 by that method and has changed the actual value stored in X. So if you look at the uh, passing by reference code structure I put here, you can notice that I highlighted uh, the reference keyword there for you because that is the key, and I should have done it down here too. That is the whole key here. So both the caller and the method that's gonna receive the call, it has to have that keyword reference before the variable. As long as you do that, then you'll be manipulating the original value. If you don't do that, then all you're doing is getting a copy of the original value. You're making changes to that copy, but not changing the original value. And this really becomes more important when you start, like say, dealing with like classes and you've got all these reference items, um, all these reference items that are stored on the heap. You need to know that that's all coming in as reference values, and so you're actually changing those values when they're on the heap. But when they're stored on the stack, they're always stored as values, and so the only way to get to manipulate that original variable is with that keyword reference. So if you think about it, what that keyword's doing, it's really telling the compiler, hey, instead of copying the value, copy the reference, the address to that variable.